Hey, Susie, welcome to the Power Your Voice podcast. I'm so glad to have you here today. Hi, I'm happy to be here too. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, for, those of you, for those who are listening right now who are not familiar with you, Susie, take us back to your adulthood and what are some of the challenges that you face and how did you overcome them? Oh my God. Um, I, you know, um, I have had so many challenges. Um, and when I was younger, how I overcame them was by pushing through just, you know, it's that I'm not going to fail. I'm just going to go for it. And I, I, I'm, um, liking it to being a bull, you know, just <laughs> horns out. I'm going. Um, but as I got older, I learned that that's not the wisest course of action for overcoming obstacles. So I have a much different approach now. If I come up against an obstacle, I pause instead of plowing through. I hit the pause button and I have this question that I use for everything. And it comes from A Course in Miracles, and it's, how can I see this differently? I like that. Yeah. So um, in my younger years, it was just, um, you know, that hustle and drive and go, 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 go. Um, and then I blew my adrenals out. And so now I do pretty much just the opposite. It's, okay, I've hit a hurdle. Instead of going at 200 miles an hour, I actually stop because when you stop, you create this spaciousness, uh, mind, body, soul spaciousness to start to see solutions or maybe you weren't on the right path anyways. I mean, I, I forced myself down paths so many times that weren't even for me because I never paused. So, so uh, yeah, what go ahead. you used to do because... You know, for people who might be listening right now, maybe it's something that they're currently doing. They realize this is not working. Right. What exactly worked for you by, you know, pausing, stopping and say, hey, no, this is what I'm doing. This is not working. This is not helping me. But what exactly, what technique did you use to, uh, to overcome it? Technique. I... I tuned in. How's that for a technique? I tuned in for my, to myself. Intuition? Intuition. Um, like I said, that question, how can I see this differently? Looking at it from different angles. Um, exploration. It's exploration. So my technique would be tuning in and then exploring the possibilities, um, exploring the situation. Why, why isn't this working? Or why have I hit this hurdle? Um, is there a lesson in here for me to learn? I mean, why did this come up? So there, there isn't any one magic bullet for this, but I'm telling you, if you plow through, you're not going to learn anything and you're, you're really not going to overcome the hurdle. The hurdle is just going to move with you. It's like, you know, you're out there on the, the track field and you're pushing that hurdle down, <laughs> down the track. But when you pause, and explore and tune in you are you you're in a position to start transforming whatever the situation is that makes sense yeah yeah okay yeah, yeah cuz a, a lot of times we have challenges in our life and kind of stinks but oh, yeah. we realize no I'm actually glad this happened because we learn a lot through those challenges we really find out who we are now i i, I know in your past you had a lot of self doubt challenges how had you overcome those oh well okay so self-doubt um you know i have to go back even further because you know everybody's different my my upbringing was i was raised by a, a a mom who was a narcissist and when you're in that narcissistic environment um you're constantly beat down because the other person needs to feel good about themselves so that was my Honestly, for decades that went on, even after I left the, left the home. So, I it was a breeding ground for self doubt and lack of confidence. Um, I I attempted suicide when I was twenty. I mean, it was that hard. And so, how I overcame self doubt again? There's no magic bullet for this. There's no specific technique. 
It happens over time and it begins to happen when you, again, pause, you'll hear me say this a lot, and, and start to do that inner exploration. You know, why, where, where is this coming from? I, you, can't, you can't heal anything unless you stop and look inside. Um, I've got professional help too. Um, I have a group of women and my, my husband has a group of men <laughs> and he, he, he meets with his guys and I meet with my gals and, um, these women, we've been meeting once a month for eight years. That's great. Yeah. And I really believe in that process is really when my self doubt started to shift. Number one, because especially for women, well, my husband says it's the same for him too. Um, women often feel they're the only one feeling that way. So I thought I was the only one that had this self-doubt thing. Come to find out just about everybody does. And I didn't learn that until I started meeting with this group of women. And as we got more comfortable, um, you know, we're women, we like to go deep and talk about our emotions, but we began to discover that every single one of us was struggling with self-doubt. So then together, I love this phrase, we're better together. Together, um, we helped each other work through our self-doubt. We helped each other um, step into it as well because self-doubt can be a wall. It's one of those self-limiting walls. Um, and it helps to have people at your side to help you step into that space. And when you step into that space of self-doubt and go, oh, okay, I'm still alive. I'm still here. It gives you strength to keep going. Yeah, well, the thing with self-doubt, I realized, too, we have all these fears, but really, it's not even true. It's like, I remember when I was in college, I had self-doubt that I'm going to suck at a test, I'm going to fail, 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 and then I get an A, I'm like, why did I doubt huh. myself? <laughs> you, you have you ever heard this ac acronym for fear? False evidence appearing real. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've heard it once or twice. Now, speaking of women, so what, what are our innate female traits? And how do they get in the way for women? Okay, so the innate female traits are we're nourishers, givers, and pleasers. It's just we're born that way. And that's cool. Um, however, these are the very traits that trip women up. And I think this is really I, um, good information for men to understand because uh, we, we, we need men to, to um, point things out to us sometimes. Um, and we drive men nuts because we're over fixers. We love to fix things. <laughs> Is that not true? <laughs> so um, anyway, so women are innately nourishers, givers, and pleasers. And those are beautiful traits, but they're the very traits that trip us up. And they trip us up because we're, we're so busy nourishing, giving, and pleasing, and over fixing, and over caretaking, that we tend to forget about ourselves. And women are very plagued with um, being overwhelmed. And we're, we're overwhelmed because we're not setting up good boundaries. Um, we think we need to handle it all. So we're not sharing, um, you know, maybe within the domestic household, we're not sharing domestic tasks. We're not letting go of control because we've been socially conditioned. This, this is what we're supposed to do. Um, so within the household, especially our ways is the better way. So these are all lessons I learned the very hard way. <laughs> um, but yeah, nourishing, giving, and pleasing are the three really beautiful traits that women have. But we really do need to be careful to keep those in check. Now, on the flip side of the coin, what are innate traits do you think they get in the way from men? <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, innate traits that men have. You know, it's interesting when I when I think about traits. Um, we, the, so I'm talking about the women's innate traits, which are both uh, a gift and a curse, depending on how you use them. And well, I don't know. Let me ask you what what are some traits that men have that work both for you and against you? I mean, I I would probably say we we always have to be busy and. It's like, for example, I'm kind of going, going through this now. It's like, as you're born, your father would teach you, you always work hard. You have to make money. You have to provide for your family. And if you don't, you're a failure. If you're not making enough money, like men have to 
a lot, a lot of guys, they might feel that they have to make more money than their, their, their woman, their wife. It's like my wife, she is a marriage and family therapist. And there are some guys who would not be with a woman if they make more money than them because it makes them feel like they're not a man, which, right. you know, at the end of the day, we're a team. It's like, it doesn't matter who makes more money. It's we're a team. Right. So some guys that, that, that might be a thing that they feel that they're a failure. They're not mm-hmm. making enough money or something because they don't feel that they can provide for their family, which isn't true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I completely agree with you. So, you know, I feel like we're at this, um, we're at this huge paradigm shift that is starting to happen and this raising of awareness. So I am 56. My husband is nine years older than me. And so he's 65. And it's been really wonderful to watch because he always said, you know, you can't, what's that saying? You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, apparently you can. (laughs) So, you know, it's been beautiful watching him, um, start to unwind from those very hardcore beliefs that he was indoctrinated with, which is exactly what you were just talking about. Of, you know, he's got to be um, the, the breadwinner. He needs to take care of everything. He needs to never show his emotion. You know, men don't cry. Men aren't emotional. Um, and that's just poppycock. How's that for a word? <laughs> it's very true. I say I, thinking back so my father passed away when I was 15 years old Mm. and honestly I probably saw maybe once in my entire life cry yeah like he didn't cry and for a while I didn't really cry I didn't show my emotions now I have two boys Mm -hmm. and I've cried with them I'm like you know because I mean at the end of the day we're all human beings and a lot of us I mean like some guys they cry but they're like hide and cry in the corner or cry in their room or cry in their car because god forbid you cry you're not a man which is not true like deep down inside we're all emotional people it's okay to cry and honestly when you cry you feel good you let go a big weight off your shoulders it's hey i'm a a human being it's okay to cry it's actually a good thing to cry and women love and appreciate guys who are willing to show their emotion because it means they're a human being. (laughs) Absolutely. And I think, you know, for women, um, it's really important for us to to honor the, honor the uh, man's exploration of their emotions. Not all women too. And again, that's because of this social indoctrination of both men and women, that women have been socially, um, indoctrinated to believe that the man is there to take care of them. So when they see weakness in man, um, a man, it makes them uncomfortable. Um, you know, I had, I had an experience last year, so I-, I thought this was interesting. My husband and I went on this, um, road trip to Baja, Mexico, and my husband's a scuba diver and, um, before we got on the plane, he was starting to get a cold. And by the time we got to the place where he's going to go diving, he is full on sick. I never get sick. Whatever this germ was, I got sick. I got it too. When we got home, we found out we both had walking pneumonia. So we're on this road trip all the way through Baja, Mexico. We both have walking pneumonia. I have no sense of direction. So I really rely on my husband when we're traveling. (laughs) And he's so damn sick. He has no sense of direction. But I remember thinking a couple of times, it's like, wow, this is kind of scary because I, I rely on him for his sense of direction. And, but because we were both sick, sick, we just partnered up and worked together on it. But I did have those moments of, Ooh, I, I do rely on him for this. Um, another that just happened, I talking about hitting hurdles or roadblocks challenges. I hit a huge one last week and it took me down hard and my it's actually I think the first time my husband's ever experienced one of my meltdowns and I don't have them very often I think the last one I had was three years ago um but what was really great is I knew enough to say I don't need you to fix me because 
um, men often feel like they need to be the one with all the answers. Yes, yes. So, yeah, so I was really clear, even through all my sobbing, I said, I don't need you to fix me. I just need you to be here for me. And that was great. And he was. It still freaked him out a bit because the next day he called a friend and said, you got to check in on her. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but um, I like what you were saying. You know, relationships are a partnership. The more men speak up, the more women speak up, the, the healthier we're all going to be. Yeah. One of the big things that I believe now, and especially that you talk about it, for us guys, we always fix things, fix mm -hmm. the sink, fix the refrigerator, fix the car, always fixing, 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 fixing. And I've learned now sometimes, yeah, we don't need to fix anything. Women just want us to listen. Yes. Be present. So if you're a guy and you listen to this, you don't have to fix everything. You don't have to have the solutions. You don't have to have the answers. Just be quiet and listen. <laughs> you know, I have such a great little quick story around that. Um, my husband, we were sitting at dinner one night and I had just shared something with him that was really vulnerable, something I was trying to figure out. And I look across the table and there's nothing like total silence mode. And I felt really hurt. I even got, you know, teared up. And he said, well, why, why are you upset? And I said, I just shared something really vulnerable and there's no response. And this is how far he's come with his own work on himself. And he got quiet. And a couple of minutes later, he said, and he got, he teared up and he said, I didn't respond because I don't know how to help you. I don't know how to fix this for you. And I just want to be able to fix it for you which was, gave me the permission to say, oh, okay, well, let me tell you, I can tell you how you can help me. And then it was fine, but my lesson learned in that moment was when I have something that I need help with, I can't expect him to guess what it is I need, is to voice, this is where, this is how you can support me. Yeah, no, that that's good. Yeah, and I think for being a guy, it helps too, is like when our girlfriends or wives, fiancés, whatever, if they're talking to us, say, hey, honey, when you start the conversation, I want to tell you something that's bothering me. I don't need you to fix anything. I don't need a solution. All I need from you is to listen. Because then we're like, okay, I'll listen. Because in the back of our mind, you're hearing the person that you love telling you something and you're thinking, oh my gosh, how do I fix this? What can I do to help her? So when you go right into the conversation in the beginning, you already say, I don't need you to fix anything. I just need you to listen. You already know what's expected. And then just listen. It makes right. it so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a friend. She yeah. asked her husband. She said, whenever I talk, talk to you, at least nod your head and grunt. And yeah. he does that. And it's great. And she's fine. <laughs> yeah, because otherwise, it doesn't look like we don't care. Because we do care. We just... I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, and That's I know when my husband, I always joke around, it takes him 24 hours to process things. Oh, it does. It can. Now, yeah. one thing I want to ask you, I know you're very passionate about wellness and nutrition. Why are you so passionate about it? I lost my dad to cancer, and um, that was over 25 years ago. Um, and I guess, you know, even growing up, I... Uh, my parents are pretty health oriented and, you know, you have popular suburban farming is now and my parents farmed their backyard like none other. So I grew up eating healthy, really got off track probably in my 20s. But when my dad um, got cancer and when he died from cancer, it, he was somebody who so wanted to live. And I thought I can honor his death by really taking care of myself. Um, doing what my dad didn't get to do. So um, that was a turning point, not only on the nutrition end of things, but on the emotional end as well. I was in an abusive marriage at that time. My husband, my ex-husband now was an alcoholic and verbally abusive. It took me a while, but I ended up leaving, leaving that relationship too. And then fast forward many years, um, I was the advertising director her media company, um, and I had really learned all I could learn, and I was really clear on two things. I, I wanted to have my own business, 
I knew that and I didn't want it to be retail. And so I launched that thought and it, two years later, I ended up buying a retail nutrition store. So I got one part of that, that equation, right? And I owned that for 10 years. So that was really my yeah. deep dive into nutrition. Um, you know, things, what we want always doesn't happen the way we think it should. And um, so I don't, you know, especially, you know, I'm at this point in my life, um, to me, there's nothing more important than my health and well-being. I mean, I, I want to be alive for a long time. This is the body that I get to live in. I need to take care of it. I saw a sign once that said, if you don't care, take care of your body, where are you going to live? Very true. Yep. I, it, it, it really saddens me, the state of health, especially in the United States, um, which could be so taken care of by eating healthier. Um, so anyways, all I can do is lead by example. Um, and I make choices around that. I make choices to eat healthy food. I make choices that on a daily basis, I'm not eating sugar and junk food. Um, it's not that I um, don't allow myself from time to time, but I, I guess I should, my, my body is clean enough, my mind is clear enough, that um, I can really tell how I feel if I'm not living, you know, in a healthy, from a healthy place. Yeah, I mean, when you exercise and eat healthy, I mean, honestly, you should just feel much better. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And um, I, you know, I feel, I'm pretty, I'm a pretty young 56. I, did I say I'm 57 and 56? I don't age myself, but I'm really proud of where I'm at in my life and how I've taken care of myself. Um, I will say this, it does take a little bit more effort now, not much, but you know, I just can't, I, um, as you get older, you lose your wiggle room, Let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting too, because some people, when they get older, like, eh, you know, I'm older now, my back is supposed to hurt or I'm not supposed to be, have as much energy as I'm supposed to have. I'm like, I've, I worked in rehab actually and uh -oh. met a guy who's in his seventies and he's like, he does several hundred pushups every single day. I'm like, there's no way you do it. No. He's like, seriously, I do. I mean, this guy, he's in his seventies and he's in better shape than a lot of people in their twenties. Yeah. It's definitely mindset. I mean, if you want to start falling apart, I mean, you can let yourself, but it doesn't have to be that way. And that's important to realize you can be 50, 60, 70, 80 years old and be extremely healthy if you choose to. It's a choice. Yeah. Yep, there's the word. It's a choice. It's making making that choice. Yeah. So that's the choice I've chosen. And um, I learned a lot from my nutrition customers, um, especially my customers that were in their 80s and 90s. Um, and, oh, gosh, vibrant um, posture is huge. If you want to feel younger, <laughs> really check in with your posture. And there, you know, there's science behind that too, because you're keeping um, your, uh, your, your uh, flow of energy and your lymphatic system. Um, and even just like sitting up straight or you feel better. But all my older customers at my store who had that young energy, they all had really good posture. <laughs> And they all had this zest and love for life, whatever it was for them. I remember one woman is a dancer, and she's got to be in her late 80s now, and she still ride, rides her bike everywhere. I live in a small town, so I see her out and about. And another man, Pasquale, he has since passed on, but that was in his late 90s. And I asked him once, I said, what's your secret? And he said, it's, he just loved music. You know, it's feeding us always a good music, good food. I and mean, we're not talking junk food, like really good food and friends that connection human connection yeah i mean that 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 is good i mean it's it's so incredibly important to take care of yourself and especially too now nowadays speaking of posture i remember when i was a kid my sister and teachers they always say sit up straight sit up straight and when you're young you're like oh, why do i need to do that but as you get older you realize it's very important that's a big problem that we have nowadays because how often do you see people on their cell phone Oh, absolutely. The whole, oh, you know how many headways? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, I've, I've heard in rehab, when you have your phone down and you're looking at it, it's, well, I think it's like a 
40 to 60 degree angle, it's like putting something, I think it's like 30 to 60 pounds of weight on your head. Yeah. So, wow, that can cause some severe neck issues. Absolutely. But just wanted to move, move on with this. So I know you have this six principles of success. That was interesting. They all start with the C. <laughs> what are these? And why do women approach success from the top instead of the bottom? Okay. So the six success principles for women are from the bottom up. Clarity, conviction, confidence, compassion, connection, and contribution. So we were talking earlier about the innate traits that trip women up, that are, that are also beautiful, that nourishers, givers, pleasers. So women often in leadership are, are leading or in work or whatever they're doing, are leading from the top of the, this is a pyramid, the top of the pyramid, compassion, connection, and contribution. And they haven't built the platform to stand on, which is the clarity. This is um, transforming. You get to clarity by transforming societal legacies um, that so often leads women into that space of being over busy and overwhelmed. So we're, we're really good at compassion, connection, and contribution. We're not as good at clarity, conviction, and confidence. So most women have it completely backwards. So uh, when I'm coaching, I often use this framework, um, and I'm actually in February launching a whole course um, around this, but um, we always start with clarity. What are, uh, what are the self-limiting beliefs that are getting you in your way? What agreements have you made with yourself that you don't even realize you've made? And this works for both men and women. What, what beliefs are, do you have, again, that you, you've adopted because of social conditioning or maybe um, how it was modeled to you by your parents or people in your life? So starting back at the beginning, which is getting clear and building that solid foundation to stand from. And then from that point, you have more strength to feel that sense of conviction about whatever it is you're doing, whatever your mission is, you know, your, your mission is to really get out there and use your voice, which is fantastic, especially with your background. I just love that story. And then that from that conviction, you start to embody confidence. You're, you're standing on this solid ground. You're, you've got something that you're, you feel very strongly about. And from that, that confidence starts to rise up and, and then compassion are the, these beautiful gifts that you can, um, a woman and man can add in. But compassion is expansion of intuition. It's empathy. Um, it's compassion for self and for, for humanity. And I really want to land on that. It's self is so important. I call it sacred selfishness, the practice of prioritizing self. Because if you, if you aren't taking care of yourself, you are giving from a place of depletion, and that isn't really giving at all. Um, it's not healthy. And then you've got con connection and con contribution right at the top of the pyramid. Now, for somebody who's listening and they need clarity, how, how can they find clarity? Well, um, here's some questions. So I just taught a short uh, free training on the four stages of clarity, which are reveal, and that's revealing what's hidden. You can't change anything unless you can see it. Um, the second stage is releasing, so releasing what is holding you back, responding differently, and reorienting. So the, for revealing, for getting into a point of clarity, these are some really good questions. The first one is, what hidden influence or influences are driving you? How have you been socialized by family and society? How have these hidden influences created your story? What thoughts, beliefs, and habits have been fostered because of your social conditioning? How have your actions, what are you doing, how are you behaving, been influenced by your story? In what ways have hidden influences and your story contributed to overpleasing, overdoing, and overwhelm? These are questions that are designed for women, but I think it's the same, similar for men as well, is we um, hit a certain point in life and things may not be working quite the way we want. We're feeling overwhelmed, we're feeling confused. 
And it's because from that moment we're born, we're collecting. It's like we've, we've got this empty suitcase and we're collecting stuff in our suitcase that isn't yours. It, it isn't yours. I mean, it's just come from outside influences. So these questions are a really great way to kind of start that sorting process. Yeah, I, I believe that a lot of this stuff all comes from just growing up as a kid. Like I, I remember when I was a kid, my dad, we don't have enough money. We don't have enough money. We never have enough money. And then you grow up as an adult and I want to get this, but I don't have enough money. I don't have enough money. Yeah. And you're not even aware of it until you're like, where the heck is this coming from? Oh, I remember when I was a child, we never had enough money. So even now, if I don't have enough money for something, I even tell my kids, yeah, we really don't need it. instead of don't have enough money, don't have enough money, don't have enough yeah. money. And then you're starting to thinking, oh, I'm not worth it. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve it. And it has nothing to do with that. But as a child, it's like every time your parents, you ask your parents for something, they always say, you don't have enough money. You're like, what? I have no value. You don't love me. You just start creating all these stories, which mm -hmm. are not even true. You just don't realize what your circumstances of your parents might be. Exactly. And so you've been filling up your suitcase with that. And it's like you're carrying around, you know, this 200 pound bag of, of luggage, which weighs you down and suppresses you. And, and, um, basically puts a lid on your ability to really shine. So I, I love how you shared that though. Um, that is a really good example of having at least enough clarity to get to that point of awareness to make a change. Yeah, and the yeah. Cra crazy thing is that it affects everybody. Like I was talking to a guy last week He's a recruiter. He makes over $250,000 a year. I mean, he's doing pretty well for himself. <laughs> and he has these self-doubt issues when it comes to money. And I'm like, what the heck? Dude, you're killing it. You're doing so well. I'm like, where is this coming from? He's like, well, honestly, when I was a child, my sister used to steal money from my piggy bank. I'm like, what? All these insecurities goes back to his childhood. His sister... And she once like took a couple thousand dollars from a bank account. All these money issues he has goes back to his childhood. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, most everything uh, challenge we have as an adult, something's happened in our childhood. I don't think any child person gets through childhood, young adulthood without being scathed. I don't care how good your parents are. Even I feel like I'm a good parent. My son is 29 now. And when he was a teenager, I sat, we were having dinner one night and I said, gosh, I wonder what you're going to need a psychologist for because of me. <laughs> I mean, we don't have a manual. I mean, I, I have my own issues and I probably plopped some of those on him un, unwittingly. So, um, yeah, be, being having this sense of awareness uh, that comes from, from pausing, um, clearing out the clutter, uh, and taking a really hard look at yourself can be one of the, the most empowering things you can do for yourself. Yeah, yeah, de definitely. So I wanted to ask you, women and men, we're also hard on ourselves, like constantly beat beat ourselves up. Why, why, why do we do this? Yeah, why do we do that? Why don't we just stop? <laughs> well. I love the word soften. We all really, it would serve us all to soften. And we are, um, and I know, you know, again, talking with women, um, am I, and just, you know, learning from myself, we're, we're very hard. You know, I, a lot of the work I do is around how we've been socially influenced because that's a huge part of it. So we've been socially influenced to, we live in a culture that's, look at our culture. Our culture is modeling, you've got to be perfect. You've got to be enough. You've got to do more. You need more you, and you should do more. The shoulds, the should monster. Um, and we put the bar up really high, which is another thing. You know, you gotta have the bar up high. There's so much culturally about, I feel like somebody used to be standing behind me and they were just shoving me and shoving me and shoving me. Um, and if I didn't get it perfect, I was really, really hard on myself. So, and I'm still that way. That my husband last night said, Susie, why are you being so hard on yourself? This is that teamwork again. I went, oh God, you're right, I'm doing it again. <laughs> Um, 
So softening, pausing, really tuning into the, the language of your body. So recognizing when, what, what your body does when you're being hard on yourself or pushing yourself. And for me, I get, um, I, I clamp down and my shoulders kind of round. You know, if I'm working on my computer, my whole physical self is just tense. Um, that's usually where my thoughts are going into, wow, this isn't good enough. Um, this isn't enough. I, I even have, um, I have a, whoops, oh, this won't be on video, but I have a thimble sitting on my desk and it's to remind me that you, it's a, a saying, give a person, how does it go? Uh, give somebody a thimble of water who's parched and you've given them a world, the world. So again, we live in this culture of overing and pushing and doing too much. And the backlash of that is we are very, very hard on ourselves and it doesn't serve anyone. And you aren't going to change unless you start to be aware of it. So that awareness of body language, and then asking questions. I love questions. Questions are um, how you get in touch with your soul. It's like the window to your soul. And I read something the other day, it might have been Brene Brown, who said, uh, really good leaders are always asking questions. Um, I'm working on a end of year thing with 123 questions in it from blogs I've written over the years. So questions are just start asking yourself questions. Why am I being hard on myself? Where is this coming from? What's the real source of this? Is this serving me? What if I just backed off? What's going to happen? Actually, yeah, because yeah, a lot, a lot of times we want to be perfect. But being perfect is too much work. It's very yeah. stressful. It's not good for us. It's it's not healthy. I mean, I'm sure some pe people die, literally die of heart attacks and strokes because they try so hard. Everything has to be perfect. Like I know when I was in college, unless I got a hundred, I was not happy. Mm. And I remember I used to stay up for like two, two, three, four, five o'clock in the morning to write a paper to make sure that I got a hundred. And I had a, a classmate of mine, I'm like, I would ask him like, how, how much work do you put in your stuff? Cause he was getting A's too. It's like two, three hours. And I was jealous. I was like, I spent 10, 15 hours to get an A. You spend two, three hours. But for him, a 90 was good enough because really a 90 is an A, it really is. But for me, I needed a hundred to prove to myself that I was smart because my entire life I was always called stupid and I wouldn't do that. Oh, of course, yeah. Like, why am I doing it? It's just, it's not you know, worth it. Uh, that's so interesting. My husband, like I said, he's 65 now. He's a really young 65. He was <laughs> held back in third grade and um, he labeled himself stupid. And so he went into overdrive his whole life to prove that. So same thing that you're, you're, you're saying. Um, yeah, we need to just all stop that. I was playing around with a, a blog title. Um, last year, I went to this really awesome con uh, conference for women. And um, I don't know if you know who El Elaine, oh shoot, Elaine. Fisher, Elaine Fisher, she's a clothing designer, very, very, very successful clothing designer. Um, 1,200 employees worldwide, uh, high, very high end. And she was at this conference, there was about 200 women. Um, and it was so cool, she just came to participate. She was gonna be one of the, the main people. But when she got up on stage, they were doing this uh, interview style. And, and mind you, this is a woman who's built a multi, multi, multi million dollar business worldwide. And I'm listening to her and it's like, wow, she's kind of a, a, a blunderer. She just kind of blunders around. Just like somebody said, well, how did you do this? Oh, I don't know. We tried this. We tried that. That worked. This didn't work. That did work. And that's how she's built her business up to this very huge level. So my thought was, what if, you know, that saying, um, um, 60s in the new 40 or I don't know what uh, or 30s the new 20 um, I thought what a blundering is the new perfectionism 
So let's just be ourselves. And I tend to be a bit of a blunder. I, I love that. I love kind of trying this and trying that. I don't have a direct route um, anymore. I used to be a perfectionist. I say, I still say I'm a perfectionist in recovery. Um, but it's not serving any of us any good, least of all ourselves. Yeah, well, I, I think the problem that we have is so many of us, we compare other people to ourselves. So you see somebody who's always getting A's or they're more successful than we are. And we think, well, that's, I need to be like them, but we don't really understand. It's like, for example, you have somebody who works, 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 they're workaholic and they're very successful in their business. They're making millions of dollars but their relationship with their family is just horrible. So you have to, don't compare, we have to stop comparing ourselves to other people because maybe if you were like that person, you would realize, no, I'm actually doing great the way I am. I have, um, I love to set themes for the year and it was a year before last. Um, my theme for the year was be yourself, the world will adjust. Yeah. It's easier to be ourselves too. Yeah, just be yourself because each one of us, we're like, each one of us is a, is a spice. And if we were all the same spice, it would be really, really boring. And yeah, I'm, you know, I, one of the things I had to own about myself, um, and actually I, I'm, I like about myself, I am not academic. That is just, I'm a very kinesthetic learner. For me to sit down in a classroom, I, it's just, torture i need to be moving and learning and trying things so i'm more of an explorer and experimenter that's who i am i have a friend who she's total academic i mean she's got all these you know, phds and doctorate and that's her thing and she's great at that but there was a point in my life where i felt less than because i didn't have a doctorate behind my name but that's just not me i'm very intuitive um i just kind of know stuff so, um, but yeah, be you, because if we're all the same, it's really boring and we, it, it's really important that we all bring our unique spice to this dish called life. Yeah, well, and it's important to just be authentic and be yourself, not be like somebody else. And a, for, for a lot of young people who might be listening, got to stop worrying about what mommy and daddy thinks, because you might have somebody just like you mentioned your friend mom and dad they're doctors so i have to be a doctor because if i'm not a doctor my mom and dad won't love me but you're not being who you should be i mean if you don't want to be a doctor don't be one because then eventually you're just going to start resenting other people you know um this is many years ago i was at a graduation picnic for two young women who i knew pretty well um and one of them was really driven by her parents. And boy, if her mom heard me, she probably would have slapped me. But I whispered her in her ear, I said, whatever you do, do not conform. And in both their ears, one of them did, one of them didn't. Um, one of them is just out there really enjoying life. The other one is very much on that career path. And I don't know how she's doing, but I completely agree with you. Um, you know, we, uh, parents are there to serve um, a certain purpose, um, security and guidance and wisdom. But at, at some point in young adulthood, late teen years, um, what's healthy is to begin testing out, you know, what are my thoughts? What do I believe? What choices do I want to make? Uh, what is best for me? Um, but a lot of parents live through their kids. I'm a really good example of this. My son, for his senior project, became a private pilot. And he's a really good pilot. The, the, the accepted cultural track is that your kid goes off to a four-year college. So I pushed him into that scenario. Um, so he's holding heavy, a really heavy course load, plus flying, which is huge as well, uh, to become a commercial pilot. And it was too much. In hindsight, my big regret is I should have just let him do what he wanted to do, which was go to flight school and then bring the academic in later. Now I see what I was doing because I didn't go the academic track and I felt like I was wrong about that. I pushed it onto him. 
he seems fine with it. I talk to him about yeah. all this stuff, but you know. <laughs> That's why it's so good and so important to have a good relationship with your kids. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I think the reason why we probably do that stuff is you, we want to please our parents, but if we don't do what they want or what they suggest, then we might feel like we're failures and we let our parents down and then we're not good enough, which really it's, you know, if your mom and dad really love you, they don't care what the heck you do as long as you're happy. I mean, that's what really should matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Um, oh, we've just seen that in the news of those two celebrity parents that were uh, swindling to get their kids into college. Yeah. I mean, like with that, especially maybe your kids just shouldn't have gone to college. I mean, if right. you have to cheat in school, you probably don't belong there. And honestly, those parents had enough money. Those kids didn't need to go to school <laughs> anyways. <laughs> I think, you know, the most important thing we can do at any point in our life, the, the, the biggest gift we can give ourselves, to give the people in our lives, give our children is to work on ourselves. That's it. I mean, discover, peel those, peel the, the layers of the onion away. Um, you know, peeling is revealing. And, you know, this is just me. I've always loved human behavior. I, I've loved it since I was 14 years old. It just has intrigued me. But um, it's just fascinating to figure out what makes you tick and what makes you talk. Yeah. And that's now, easier. Now, always having to do stuff. There are healthy ways and unhealthy ways. Like, why, why in our society we always feel that, we always need to stay busy because I, I, I know it's like I'm not doing something all the time, then I'm not being successful. Or then, then what we do is we do this with our kids. Like our kids have to play sports. Our kids have to do all this stuff. And it's just, it's very overwhelming. Okay. I got two things for you. Okay. I'm going to start with the have tos. So anytime a friend of mine uh, shared this with me, uh, a lot of people are talking about the shoulds, you know, avoiding the shoulds. But what she said to me was, Anytime you hear I should, it's a lie. Or I should say anything that follows I should is a lie. And that was eight years ago. I can remember the, the, the exact place I was sitting when she told me that. And I took that and I ran with it. And I, I totally embodied it. I trained myself. I shoulds, in my case, I shoulds, I have tos, I need tos. Those were like on constant repeat. So I I just, I really, really trained myself to tune in. And anytime I heard myself say one of those three, you know, I should, I would again hit the pause button and think, okay, what is it I want? What's going to fill me up right now? Why is it I feel like I should do this? So there's one tip. Anything after I should is a lie. The other one is there's unhealthy, busy, and healthy, busy. Unhealthy busy, I describe it as scurrying about and you're you're heading here and you're heading there and you're just hustling and moving really hard, but there's no focus. Healthy busy is busy with intention. So it's busy that is is, um, inspired by action. Unhealthy busy is often driven by reaction. You're constantly reacting and having to catch up. Um, So healthy busy is setting your intention for what it is you wanna accomplish and having enough spaciousness in your day that you're able to have and to create action instead of reaction. Now, question, so you might have a parent, I mean, this happens a lot with parents. I need my kids to stay busy. So what do they do? They, they have after school programs, then they play like three or four sports. The parents are driving all over the city, all over the state. And really all they're doing is causing themselves lots of stress. What should they do to, I mean, they, 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 they don't realize they're actually causing stress because they think their kids always have to be busy, but they probably don't need to be that busy. Yeah, they don't. And we have a problem with our society. We, we, and I don't have an answer to that um, specifically, other than there is so much information out there coming, you know, into the mainstream about, you know, this over busying of our kids. We're, 
we're, we're training our kids to be busy. We're, you know, at a young age, they have, they're stressed and getting stress headaches. Their cortisol levels are high. Kids are getting, are, are uh, becoming pre-diabetic at young ages. Kids are having cholesterol issues at young ages. We didn't have this a few decades ago. We had other issues, but not this issue. Um, so I think the best thing we can do, again, is working on ourselves, modeling behavior, having these conversations, questioning, why, why do I have my child in all these activities? It could be a, a, an act of preservation. You've got two working, two working parents and they're just doing the best they can and this is what they do. They've got to get their kid off to another activity. And it's really heart-wrenching and it's really sad. Um, you know, there's more and more conversations and books being written and um, people in authority roles coming out with information that we've got a problem and we've got to turn this ship around. So through doing things like podcasts and you asking that question, it's, um, it's challenging people to think. Maybe there's somebody listening today that's going, wow. I haven't thought about that for, before. My kids really are running. They are stressed. They are collapsing at night. Um, I need to do this differently. Yeah, because I wonder, you, you have parents who push their kids to do certain things. I mean, should the kid do that? Should they not do that? I mean, I'll just use a good example. My oldest son, he's nine years old. He's in Taekwondo. The reason why I have them do is because I think it's great because it's exercise, keeps them disciplined, which discipline is very important, especially being in school, teaches you to be respectful and all that kind of stuff. And then he has his black belt, which is wonderful. He's only nine years old. Wow. And I'm like, it teaches him a skill set. It's like one day when you become an adult and you're in a very challenging situation, I believe he can think, well, when I was a kid, I had to break all these boards, like literally in his closet. I mean, there's probably like a hundred boards that he broke. Now you can't break a hundred boards at the same time, but you can break them one at a time, which is just amazing. So for me, I want him to be able to have that experience where he can look later on in life and say, wow, I was able to overcome this. So that's the reason why I have him do that. And he, he wants to quit. He's like, oh, it hurts. I'm like, should I really have him quit? I really don't know. I don't want to be pushing him to do something that he really doesn't want to do. But then I, I don't know what to do sometimes. It's like, am I being too pushy? Am I not being too pushy? I don't know. And I think you a know, lot of parents might be experiencing some of this stuff. This is where it's so important to have um, people around you. So I, I talked about my women's group earlier. Um, my, my husband is involved with the Mankind Project um, and they have what are called I-groups. And so he, work, he meets twice a month with his I-group. And it's an opportunity where when you, you are in this dilemma, like I'm not really sure what to do, where you can, you can bounce it off other people and hear their perspectives. And it really helps you sort through your emotions. That's a hard, that's a hard one because it is a fine line between, well, yeah, Taekwondo is awesome and the skills your son is learning are fantastic. Um, I suppose, you know, if my child was in a puddle of tears every day and distraught and it was causing him a high level of stress, yeah, that's something to consider. If there can be a learning experience about, you know, what parts of this do you love? Are there parts of it he loves and parts of it he doesn't? So, you know, how does he compensate for that? Yeah. I remember when my son was um, going for his pilot's license and he was 16 at the time. He was the youngest person in the flight school to actually get his pilot's license, but he had to do the actual test. And he was dragging his feet and dragging his feet. And, um, I, that I stepped in. I really did go up to bat for him and I pushed him with loving kindness to get his license. And I'm so glad I did. I mean, to at a young age to be flying an airplane into a big commercial airport with 747s flying over the top of you, this will serve him the rest of his life. 
I did that. And your son the same, I did that. But it's, it's yeah, if he had been, I hate flying, don't make me go, I hate I mean, my stress level, getting migraine, you know, through the rough hill, I wouldn't have made him continue on. Yeah, well, and, and that's the thing, because sometimes we look back as adults, and like, I'm so glad my parent pushed me to do this. I didn't really want to do it, but I'm glad I did it. Mm -hmm. So you have that. I mean, my son, he absolutely, he loves being around the kids that he's around. He loves all that stuff. He just, he's scared that he's going to fail at stuff. And ah. so for, for parents who are listening to this, you know, you, you wouldn't push your son to do, to fly airplanes if he didn't want to do it. But if you know that, they, you know, they're like 80% of it they love, 20% of them they don't like, well, then maybe we should continue to push them because of the life lessons that they can learn through it. It's just, if you allow your child to drop out of everything, then you kind of teach them, it's okay to fail, it's okay to quit. It's okay to quit, right. And we yeah. don't want to do that because a lot, how many of us in our life we've experienced, I quit on so many things, I just wish I would have continued in this one thing. Like, for example, this podcast that I have this year, I mean, going next month, I've done this for an entire year. That's something I'm very proud of because honestly, a lot of things I've quit in my life. This is one thing I've been very consistent with. And, <laughs> right <on. laughs> and a lot of us, we don't do something or we quit it because we think we're going to fail. Well, and also we need to learn how to fail because the truth is we are going to fail. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're going to be successful yeah. anything. I mean, how many business owners have failed a lot of businesses, but they're very glad that they failed at a couple because now they're running a business that they're very successful in. Mm -hmm. But if they've not failed in previous businesses, they wouldn't be where they are today. So I have this um, idea I'm playing around with, um, and I'm calling it the my year of 101 new things or new experiences. So I... Um, this isn't it, something anybody should do who's in overwhelm. It's really a fabulous idea for somebody who's done a fair amount of work of clearing their space, getting rid of the clutter, um, saying no, setting boundaries up. So what I'm going to do this year is 101 new experiences things, and I, I've got that all mushed together. So for example, um, I've never been to a theater by myself, a movie. So really? that's, yeah, really. Never have. So that's on you know, the personal side. But then I thought, you know, on the business side, I do tend to go into fear of failure mode. And so launching a new course or even putting out free things, I'm kind of like, ah, oh. I thought, well, how fun would that be? I'm just experimenting and, and racking up new experiences. So I'm just going to see how many, you know, things of value I can put out there. And some are going to work and some are going to fail. But it suddenly took the pressure off. This is my year of 101. Some of it's not going to work. Some of it is. Yeah. I've, I've heard a coach say, you know what? I'm going to try my best to fail as much as I can. And a lot of us were like, I don't want to fail. I don't want to fail. So we don't learn anything. But like if, when you really think about all the failures you've had in life, are they really failures? They're just challenges. But how much stuff did you learn through those, those situations? You learn a lot. You learn a lot. I just had a failure a week ago and I have learned a massive amount. I, from that failure, um, and the, everything that happens to us, there's a lesson in it. I, um, I have a, do you know what EMDR is? It's rapid eye therapy. Haven't heard so of it. It's a form of therapy. Um, it is fantastic. And I found this woman um, last year. So I had an EMDR session with her and I discovered the biggest hidden piece of me from my childhood as a result of that perceived failure. It actually wasn't a real failure at all, but I perceived it as a failure because of this childhood wound that I have so um, um, eloquently covered up <laughs> and I finally got it unsurfaced. So, you know, had that not happened last week, had I not, that was, I've shared earlier, that was my meltdown had, um, and I didn't, and I, what I should say, I did, I allowed myself to 
just go into the deep dark abyss um, where years ago I would have just got busy. It's like, oh, this is so uncomfortable and I would have just been busy. That's not how I do things now. If I, if I feel myself getting knocked down or feel myself going low, I just let myself go into that space because there's a lesson in there. So yeah, this um, failure is important. And yeah, we can learn a lot about ourselves. Now, if you'd go back to Susie when she is uh, like 18, 19, 20 years old through that challenging time in your life, what would you tell her? Oh, wow. Gosh. Well, you know, 1920s when I attempted suicide, I had no self-worth, none. And I would have, I would have told myself that, you know, you're, you're important. You're worthwhile. You, you have this great big smile. You light rooms up. I mean, I get teary just thinking about that because this is the stuff that my mother never said to me. Um, but yeah, every human being has something in them that's worth contributing. Um, whether you're, you're witty or you're funny or you're smart or um, you're quiet. You know, we all have these, these wonderful traits. So yeah, if I could go back and talk to myself, I'd say, despite what your mother has led you to believe, you are a worthwhile human being. Yes, and we're perfect. glad you're here. So for somebody who might be listening to this, who has those self-doubt issues, doesn't feel, feel they're worth anything, and uh, they're just looking for that so amazing sign or something, like, well, what kind of advice would you might give them? Well, there's no outside sign that you're going to find outside of yourself. It's within yourself. Um, and it sounds sort of um, simplistic, but it works. You know, we talk about our, um, hear a lot about neuroplasticity these days. Um, and so we have these, um, these neural pathways in our, our brain. And if you, and they're, you know, they're ingrained in, but, they're movable, they're pliable. So if you start talking to yourself nicely, even if you don't believe it, you're actually starting to form new neural pathways. So I think one of the most valuable things, and I didn't think about this when you first asked me about self-doubt, one of the most valuable things I did was I began a mindfulness practice with my self-talk. So I, I really tuned in, I call them um, thought loops, or another friend of them calls them doom loops. How often we have this inner self talk that's just on a loop. And we, you were talking about being hard on ourselves, how hard we are on ourselves. So the question is, these thought loops that you have, would you talk to somebody else that way? Probably not. No. So why are we talking to ourselves that way? So we have this opportunity to reframe thoughts. So a really good example came. Um, I, I had these two friends that we would meet. They don't live here. They live back east. But we would talk on the phone. And it was my turn. Each one of us would take a, a turn sharing what was going on. And then we'd get reflection back. So when I was done talking, I said, Oh, gosh, thank, thanks for listening. I was really blubbering on there, and I was uncomfortable because I've been talking a lot. And my friend said to me, Susie, I have a reframe for you. How about, thank you for witnessing my amazing life. From, oh, I'm sorry, I was really blubbering on there. It's just, you feel the difference? So this is what we can do for ourselves: is begin a mindfulness practice to tune in to how we're talking, reframe that. And do that every single day. I mean, that, that um, uh, it's really uh, to hang out like a post-it note on your bathroom mirror. Maybe, maybe there's something in your, your car that says, catch those thought loops, reframe those thought loops. And you'll find within a month of doing it, it happens really fast, that you are feeling more uplifted. Your, your, your language has changed. Um, you're not going into self-doubt as much. So that's one. I actually have one more for you looking at the time. Um, this is going to sound really crazy, but it works. And then what I loved about it is a couple of years later, after coming up with this idea, I read in a 
psychology thing that a psychologist was suggesting this. So what I did was I named my most common challenges. So um, self-doubt became Dory. Not enough was Nancy. And I can't remember the rest of them because they've kind of dwindled away. So whenever I feel self-doubt show up, I'm like, hey, Dory, why are you here? And we have this conversation. So what it does is it, it, it stops self-doubt from um, taking over my being. And it's like I sit her down in front of me and go, why are you here? And we get to have this conversation. And I learned from that. Oh, that's what's going on. That's what's triggered my self-doubt. Okay, great. You served your purpose. You can go now. I know it sounds really str strange, but. <laughs> well, I, I know we're going into time, but I just, just want to ask you through, through your coaching, you do a lot, a lot of interviews. Has there ever been like a question that you may have wished somebody would have asked you because you would have been able to give some information that could have been very beneficial, but no one ever asked you that question? And what would that be? Oh my gosh. That's a big one. <laughs> That's a big one. And I don't think so because if they haven't asked that, I usually offer the question up. Okay. Yeah. I'll say, hey, have you thought about this? So <laughs> I don't leave anything unturned. <laughs> what, what, what are like three good things that you really want to hit home that you want people to take away from this interview? Okay. So anything after I should is a lie. Um, start a mind, mindfulness practice for your thought loops and do loops, uh, reframing. Um, and yeah, really think about how you've been influenced and how that's influencing who you are as a person today and what you can do differently. Yeah. Which I'm sure almost all that goes to childhood and watching tv because the tv is always you're not pretty enough you yeah. if you don't if you don't drive this car if you don't have this kind of makeup if you don't live in a house like this you're not good enough yeah. i mean that's yeah we're in we're absolutely inundated especially when we look at social media it's like we look at our friends they're going on these beautiful vacations and wow if only i was like that person but we really don't know what's going on in that person's life. We really don't know. We're just basing off of pictures that we see. Right. You yeah, know. exactly. Now, now you have this thing called calling in clarity. Yep. So how, how can people book you online? And can you tell us a little bit about this calling for clarity? So calling in clarity is a, um, a core, well, it's a framework that I use for teaching, but it's also a course that I'm launching in February. And this has come out, I actually uh, hired a woman who's got a PhD in transformational adult learning um, and spent over a year developing this curriculum. And it takes, I didn't even know what I was going to name the course, to be quite honest, until I beta tested it with um, women. And the, the course is completely designed to do really what we've been talking about today, to um, reveal what's hidden and how it's getting in your way and then shift shift that so it, it it's eight weeks and it layers on top of each other so that's the course in my i actually call it mentoring because i mentor purely from my ex own experiences um and i did interviews um i had almost 300 pages of data from interviews and i mined that for information um Anyways, I, I mentor from experience and I use the framework of the six success principles that I shared with you. And um, I love, I love, I'm a thought provoker. I'm a provoker of thoughts. That is like my most favorite thing to do is to help a woman open up to new possibilities and different ways of doing things that they hadn't seen before because of how we've been influenced. So for women who are listening to this, like who is your ideal woman that you can really help out? Is yeah, it I, age, married, that kind of thing? Uh, it doesn't matter, married, not what, but definitely age, uh, 35 and up or, thir you know, depends. Um, I work with women who have had enough life experience that they've gained um, a sense of uh, awareness and of what 
works and what isn't working. I largely work, work with women entrepreneurs and women in the, the business, world of business. Because well, I love business. I've been in business my whole life. So for someone that might be listening to this on social media or they're listening to it in a car driving to work or in an Uber or Lyft or something, <laughs> how, how can they find you online and reach out to you? Yeah, so my website is suzycarroll.com. And if you go to the mentoring page, there's a link for um, to do a, a 30 minute conversation with me. Um, and I actually really love to start that way, just to make sure we're a good fit, um, see what's going on with you. Usually within that 30 minutes, you're gonna get some uh, a, a nugget um, to run with. So that's the best way to start. And I also have a lot of free things out there. Um, there are a lot of different um, PDFs, um, mini eBooks lurking about. So just Google my name, you'll find all sorts of things. All right, sweet. Well, thank you so much, Susie, for being on the Poly Boys podcast. It's great to speak with you today. Thank yeah, you. you too. Thank you.